And uh, before we do that, I'm going to ask my good friend, Pastor Jarushik. He's from the Four Wayne Coordinator for Current Coordinator for Four Wayne Community Schools. If you can lead us with a prayer, please. Okay. Let's pray. Lord, we come uh, this evening before you to give uh, thanks and honor you in this event. We have dreams and desires and plans for our children and grandchildren. And Lord, we ask your blessing upon every person this evening and the meeting. And especially we want to bring before your altar all those desires and dreams and plans for the younger generation. And we pray that you will bless. We honor you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, beautiful for that. We had dreams. Yes, we do have dreams for our kids, for our youth, for that. Uh, so this is a great way to begin. Once again, my name is Fernando. Welcome everybody. Bienvenidos todos. Mi nombre es Fernando Zapari. Uh, gracias por venir. Thank you for coming. It is a great honor to have with us this gentleman sitting here at the table. Uh, I will start with introducing Daniel Jail. Daniel is a reporter for a Mexican newspaper. I'm doing two jobs tonight. Uh, Mr. Bill Clemmy, uh, thank you so much. Uh, coordinator for 21st Century Scholar Program, Martin Murphy. Uh, Dr. Peter Jarushik, he's uh, for Wayne Community Schools uh, current coordinator. And of course, Professor Max Montesino. And our keynote speaker, is uh, our great friend. He's done so much for this community. Chancellor Michael Wartell. Mm -hmm. Applause for Elijah mm -hmm. Again, thank you, muchas gracias a todos por venir. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, education is so important. La educación es tan importante. Education is the key to prosperity. Education knows no differences in colors or social uh, uh, classes. Education is the equalizer. Look at it. You can go to China. If you have an education, you'll be okay in China. You can go to El Salvador. Si tiene educación, va a estar bien en El Salvador. Puede regresar a México. A México, we can go back to Mexico and we'll be okay. But education is the key to prosperity. Right? And this is what's all about. It's all about education. Again, thank you so much for coming. And there's so many very important people in this room. And I'm not going to name everybody. Everybody is very, very important. But the most important people in this room to me are the kids, the young people with a lot of due respect for people like great friend Larry Graham and Michael Wartell, Chancellor. But the kids, the kids are the future of this community. And that, that is why we're doing this. And this is the beginning of many more forums to come about education and how to promote a better education with our kids. Uh, I was driving the other day in, in the country and I read a sign that says, uh, talking comes by nature. Dice, me quedó. El hablar mucho viene por naturaleza, but to keep silence is by wisdom, ¿verdad? Pero callar es por sabiduría, so I'm gonna keep silent, yo ya no voy a callar y le voy a pasar a mi gran amigo aquí, El profesor Max Montesino, la palabra. Él va a ser el moderador de este evento. Again, thank you so much for coming. Muchas gracias. I would just like to begin by thanking Fernando for organizing this event. Uh, he, he said that this is the first one, and I'm glad uh, that I was able to, to be here and help with it, at least uh, showing up because I didn't have anything to do with the organizing. I think that Bill did and many other people. The purpose of this event is to talk about the realization of the college dream. So we have here a, a group of panelists that uh, uh, Fernando already introduced. So my job will be just to call them to talk and somehow manage the 10 minutes that each of them will have. At the end, uh, Daniel Yao will 
ask a couple of questions and then we will have an interaction from the public. That's, that, those are the ground rules. Fernando told me that I should tell you that there are some cookies and beverages. <laughs> there are drinks there, Fernando? Mm -hmm. Okay, so feel free as, as we uh, uh, go about the program. To begin, since what we have to do is to talk about uh, helping college dream become a reality for our youth, uh, we will introduce uh, Chancellor Michael Wartel. Uh, Dr. Wartel has been the Chancellor at IPFW, IPFW, Indiana University, Purdue University, Fort Wayne, for a long time. And uh, he's going to be our, our uh, keynote speaker. Nuestro presentador principal, para empezar, es el Dr. Michael Wartel, es el, el eh, canciller, el presidente, el rector de la universidad de IPF Tokyo que tenemos acá. So, with you, Michael. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm honored to be here tonight and, and be able to speak to all of you. I, I love this theme of making dreams come true because I always see education as the way to make dreams come true. And whether you're talking about getting a high school education, getting a, a, an associate degree or a bachelor's degree or a master's degree at a university. All of those things make life more exciting. Now, the most important part of choosing how to be educated is, is choosing what you want to do. And many times you just don't know what you want to do. And parents, you can't tell your children what they should do because they're not passionate. They won't be passionate about what you feel like they want to do. They need to find their own way. And, and education is about helping you figure out what you're passionate about, what you love, what you love to do, and then getting the training, the education to do it. So the, the first issue is that if you want to go to college, you have to do well in high school. You have to be prepared. And many of the students that come to IPFW, or to Ivy Tech for that matter, are not as prepared as they should be. Education takes family support. So when, when students aren't prepared, ordinarily, that's because their families, their, their whole family unit hasn't worked well with them. And, and when, they, when those students come to us, many times they're they're uh, unprepared in math, they can't do simple arithmetic, they're unprepared in, in reading and, and writing, and, and we, us and Ivy Tech, have to help them along to get to the point where they can really benefit from a college education. Well, how do you choose where you want to go to college? We think we have some pretty good opportunities here in Fort Wayne. In fact, we have wonderful opportunities in Fort Wayne. It's an incredibly broad range. You can go to St. Francis, where you can get a, a Catholic-based education, faith-based education. Huntington, a different faith, but still a faith-based education. An independent school like Indiana Tech. Uh, a, a comprehensive university like IPFW. A, a place like Ivy Tech where you can not only get the basic two years of a, of a baccalaureate degree, but you can also get trained in areas where you can get jobs immediately. Um, jobs like welding, uh, auto mechanics, uh, computer repair, things like that. They, they teach at Ivy Tech and they do it extremely well. And if that's your passion, if auto repair is your passion, and I know lots of folks who have had wonderful careers in auto repair. That's, that's the place you go. So you try to choose a place to go that makes you comfortable, that makes you feel like you can pursue what you want to do. And to get there, of course, you, you have to get a decent preparation. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight that succeeding at a university, at a place like IPFW or Ivy Tech or any of the places I mentioned, it's not about being really smart. It's about really persisting, really working hard, really applying yourself. And if you stick to whatever you've chosen to do, you'll succeed at the university. You can get through and get your degree. Now, someone pointed out to me that she had spent 
eight years getting a degree. Well, that's fine. As long as, it, as long as you reach the goal, as long as you get there, then however long it takes, that, that's how long it takes. That's your personal thing. And, and you need to accept that. You, you need to kind of internalize that. Realize that that's just a part of you. Uh, you know, the traditional finishing of a, of a college education takes place in four years. That almost never happens at IPFW. People take five years, six years. That's fine. Again, as long as you reach the goal. And, and as you think about reaching that goal, you need to think about further goals. You may want to immediately go out after you get a bachelor's degree or an associate degree and get into the job market and work. Great way to, to live your life. But you also may want to become a doctor, a lawyer, you can go to graduate school, you can go to professional school, as long as you do well, as long as you apply yourself, every opportunity is available to you. And I know it's been fairly commonly reported in the media that a college education gives you more earning power. There's no question that it does. But what, it ha what hasn't been reported in the media is that almost any amount of education after high school gives you a better leg up than you had before. And people earn more, even if they just have one year of college or two years of college. So it's worth looking at, at the idea of maybe just getting one year of college, if that's all you can afford, or two years, and then slowly working toward your goals of getting, of getting more degrees. Um, once you, once you get to a college or university, once again, it's, it's how you apply yourself. It's how persistent you are, how consistent about studying, how consistent about wanting to reach that goal. And then that goal sets you up for the rest of your life. I can't tell you how many students come back and say, gee, the education I got at IPFW was exactly what I needed to get a job, to raise a family, to be secure. And there's nothing like being secure. Education leads you there. And I think my 10 minutes is about it. <laughs> <laughs> questions because there, there will be there will be a moment that we, we will be doing that now let's hear about the same the same topic from Martin Murphy he's the parent coordinator for the 21st century scholarship program scholars program at IPFW and is a longtime friend of us so Martin okay. well thank you very much uh, as Dr. Wartell talked about the importance of getting a college uh, degree or, or, or college education. I, I'm going to kind of talk about <clears throat> paying for this college education. I will tell you this, when I first started uh, back in 1973 down at Indiana University, Bloomington, total cost of attendance for one year was about $3,000. That same Indiana University today is about $20,000. And of course there's other alternatives. I mean, you know, yes, you always can stay close to home, go to an IPFW or Ivy Tech or St. Francis, but the point I'm making is, is that a college education, as necessary as it is, is expensive. The state of Indiana recognized that back in 1990 when they started the 21st Century Scholar Program. This program was started to ensure that every family in the state of Indiana could in fact afford to send their son or daughter to a, to a college to get a post-secondary education. What the state did was, they said that if a student, based upon the family's household income, met the qualifications, income qualifications, and the students take a pledge of good citizenship, meaning no drugs, no alcohol, stay out of major trouble, cannot commit a delinquent act, graduate from Indiana High School, graduate with at least a 2.5 on a 4.0 scale, and go to Indiana College, the state of Indiana would pay up to eight semesters of their college tuition. We enroll students in the seventh and eighth grade for this program. 
And what we do at our support site for Northeast Indiana at IPFW, we make sure that not only do they understand that if they complete the program, that we're there to give them support services. We know that we do a lot of first generation families. And the whole concept, I mean, I, I can remember when I started college at IU and the way it is now, we went, we stood in long lines and we waited to get to classes only to get up there and find out they were closed. Well, a lot of things was done now on computer. You can have your classes all set up before you even go. It's a totally different ball game. And if you're a first generation student and you have no one to help you or to navigate through this process, then you need the support of someone. We've done that for the, here in Fort Wayne since the program started with a support site. <coughs> we have programs to help parents and students understand the financial aid process. We have college trips to help them to understand that getting into the college of the choice is a process and that you just can't wake up your senior one day in your senior year and say I want to go to college A, B, or C and here I come, that it is a process, that there's uh, 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 qualifications that you have to fulfill, there, there, there's uh, uh, tests that you have to take. So we do that, said man, and make sure that this program was instrumental in doing that and making sure that you understood the process, walking you through that. That's why we started off in seventh and eighth grade because more and more today, you have to realize that in order to get into the college of your choice, you have to start early. You have to start thinking about it. Now, we're not asking students to stop being seventh or eighth graders. What we are asking them is, is that we want you to start the wheels turning, to start thinking about the process of getting to the college of your choice. We're going to walk you through this, all the way from seventh or eighth grade through your senior year, up until the time that you're required to sign the paperwork that's required by the state and fill out the necessary fast for a free application for federal student aid that any college student who wants to get any type of financial aid has to do. But the important thing is the state of Indiana is saying through the 21st century scholar program that we can make sure that once your student gets to be a senior and they have fulfilled the pledge, as I talked about earlier, that there will be funding waiting for them to go to the college of their choice to go to Indiana your tuition up to eight semesters or four years. Now, as Dr. Wattell says, a lot of times students take longer. But to know, to go into high school knowing that you at least have at least four years of your college tuition paid for, it's a good place to be. It's an excellent place to be. And we target, we target low to moderate income families. We target those same students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. We use the same qualifications that the federal government uses for that program, for our program. We know that in the state of Indiana, with this great program, that of those eligible, only 40% even use the program. Hmm. This is unbelievable to me. You have a program that will pay for your college. But we also know that a lot of times we go into schools and we present to seventh or eighth graders and uh, to keep it real, what if you tell them that you most of the time doesn't get past lunch? Mm -hmm. So we want, we love opportunities like this where we can come, we can talk to parents, we can let them know about the program. Once you put it on your radar, when your son or daughter gets into the seventh or eighth grade, get to this. I, I have some paperwork over there, some applications, some uh, flyers. Get the information, get them signed up, and then start working on helping them prepare themselves for getting into the college of their choice. Because as Dr. Wartell said, it is necessary. And as I'm telling you, it is expensive. And you have an opportunity to get that paid for. So we just want you to be aware of the program. You know that it's out there for you. It's been around since 1990. And we want to make sure that everyone and every community is utilizing <coughs> this program to get their son or daughter in college of choice. I think that about does it for my 10 minutes. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it is always good to hear from uh, different segments of our community. Now we will hear from uh, somebody who works at Fort Wayne Community Schools and who deals with family because uh, Peter Jarocek is, uh, did I pronounce your last name? Mark. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Peter is a great combination. He knows Spanish and many other languages, so he understands my accent. <laughs> 
Um, he is a district parent coordinator with academic services at Fort Wayne Community Schools and a great friend of our community. So, Peter. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be tonight here, and I'm especially happy to see many parents. A uh, success in education is the parental involvement. And I have a quotation here from uh, US Department of Education, say when parents are involved in their children's education, students achieve at higher levels academically, attend school more regularly, complete more homework, graduate from high school at higher rates, and enroll in a college or university at the higher rates. And that is the reality. But for some reason, in our city, we have a uh, lot of problems. And I not see many times the parents get involved in their children's education. At Fort Wayne Community School, many times we met the parents once per year school, the day they register them, even not for the first day of school. One of the things that we try to change completely, and for uh, this coming school year 12-13, we will take two high schools, South Wayne a High School and a Wayne High School and develop a completely different program because we want to have parental involvement. You know very well that uh, at uh, elementary school age, the parents participate in many programs uh, at the school of their children. Uh, math nights, literacy nights, art and performance evenings. Uh, parent-teacher conferences, but when they reach middle school, the kids not want the parents go to school. And when they uh, there's a car uh, riders, uh, they ask to drop them at the corner of the school. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we decide to change this situation, and we will have parent-teacher conferences at a high school level and we want to involve the parents. I don't know how we will do and how, uh, if you know the secret to help us, I'm willing to listen to you tonight. But uh, uh, all the studies demonstrate that the parental involvement in uh, their children's uh, student life is so important. Uh, at very early age, we need to set the goals for the future. A uh, lot of parents ask today their children, are you would like to go to college or university? And I say that is a wrong question. Don't ask that question. Say, you will go to the college and university. We need to choose which one, according to your desires, dreams, and plans. And uh, the biggest problem we have in our community here in our city is a lack of motivation. This is a generation with, without motivation. You ask any child what you want to be when you grow up, I don't care. What you would like to study, I don't know. Like two weeks ago, I met a, a doctor dentist. He came to one of our schools to speak to uh, fathers. And uh, he's a very known dentist here in our city. He set his goal at fifth grade to be a dentist. And he had so many difficulties in his life because he been uh, drawn to the army during the Vietnam War and many other things, but he never gave up. He graduated late as a dentist, but his dream become reality because he set goals. 
And if I may say something tonight is help your children to set goals for their life, for their profession. Don't tell them what profession to choose. They will choose according to their gifts and, and uh, desires and abilities. But help them to set very early in their life goals and uh, try to reach the highest and the best. And we have a great opportunities in this city. Maybe not many other cities have opportunities what we have. And uh, take advantage of all this and motivate them. Take them to the university, to the college, uh, to some uh, factories or uh, practices. Motivate them, talk with them. Uh, Pray with them, uh, share with them, uh, whatever you can do. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, now we have uh, a former professor at IPFW. Uh, he, he, his title is retired professor. <laughs> uh, he is a Spanish language and linguistics specialist, uh, Dr. William Clemé, a member of our community, and he is going to talk about a couple of issues regarding achieving that dream. Thank you very much. Uh, as a uh, former language teacher, I have to uh, confess that I have a hidden agenda. <laughs> and that is to drum up my interest in the study of foreign languages, English and Spanish. And uh, the theme of my presentation is our bilingual youth as national assets. Mm -hmm. You have to be proud of your heritage, you have to be proud of your culture, you have to be proud of the language that you grew up speaking at home. Uh, bilingualism is not a disease. <laughs> it's treated as a problem that uh, certain administrators would hope would go away. It's uh, rarely understood and uh, sometimes uh, a person who speaks more than one language is looked at askance as if there's some kind of a unpatriotic foreign spy. Um, I'm here to tell you that it is patriotic to have bilingual skills. And uh, when I speak bil of bilingualism, I'm speaking in a very broad sense. Uh, speak a little bit of a, a second language, some or a lot, depending on the household that you grew up in. Maybe grandmother spoke a little bit of Spanish and you understand it, but can't speak it. And so there's this, uh, this uh, gradient. And uh, so the speakers who uh, learn Spanish through this privileged <laughs> setting uh, are called heritage speakers. That's the new buzz term out in um, education land. And uh, heritage speakers need to be fostered. They need to be encouraged. And uh, they need to have obstacles removed <coughs> that stand in the way of their success. And right now, there is a bill um, up for uh, consideration in Washington called the uh, DREAM Act. Which we love dreams which we hope will make our dreams come true. That said, let me give you a little bit of background on uh, what uh, the Hispanic uh, cultural uh, heritage is all about. And we go back to uh, the uh, American Southwest. The year 1540, uh, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, a conquistador, um, comes through. And uh, in fact, I think there's a few places uh, where there's some cliffs in New Mexico where the conquistador inscribed uh, through this, the adelantados ones so went in such and such a year. And uh, that's in 1540. Uh, figure it out. That's 48 years after Columbus set foot <coughs> in the Bahamas. And uh, in the year 1598, uh, the Spanish uh, established the first uh, pueblo in um, New Mexico, San Juan, Pueblo San Juan, 1598. And the beautiful city of Santa Fe is established in 1609. And that's a lot sooner than 1620. So they got here before the pilgrims did. 
And um, again, with the theme of the Great American Southwest, uh, we had the Mexican-American War in, 19, 18, in, in 1848, and when this war finished, uh, Mexico signed away that huge territory uh, by being a signatory to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And one of the articles in the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty says that the U.S. promises to respect the language, culture, and religion of the people residing therein. So there's a special privilege. Uh, now, some people say that that particular article wasn't really, really ratified when the treaty was voted on. But nevertheless, that treaty incorporates an earlier treaty when we purchased uh, Florida. And so that treaty, again, uh, gives special deference and respect to the culture of the people that are being incorporated. So, um, you know, there you have it. There's a, there's a uh, shall we say, a legal obligation here, if not a moral obligation, to uh, give special deference to the Spanish speakers of the United States. And in the year 1912, the territory of New Mexico is admitted to the uh, Union and uh, officially as a bilingual state. So from the beginning in New Mexico, you had a right to plead your case in court in Spanish if you so wish. The judge may not know what you're talking about, but uh, that was your right. And, uh, and there, there you have it. Uh, then comes World War II, and we start having some xenophobic uh, behaviors. Uh, we're at war with Germany, and what happens if you go to a concert? There's no Brahms, no Beethoven, and people with uh, German names uh, start to uh, change their surnames. Last names like Brandt, B-R-A-N-D-T, they drop the T, and they become Brand, and uh, so on. And uh, World War II uh, reacts to linguistic and cultural matters in a slightly different way. World War II uh, had, it, it was a linguistic emergency. We were at war with Japan, with Germany, with Italy. And suddenly, how are we going to understand what the enemy's talking about and how are we going to protect ourselves? And so suddenly, uh, we're, we have linguists all over the place in, in Washington. Uh, we even recruit uh, Hopi Indians to use their language as an in-between stage in encrypting things so that the enemy could not uh, figure out what we were saying. And we have the Defense Language Institute set up for teaching language to the military. The State Department sets up the Foreign Service Institute. And um, so we're on to the importance of language looked at it in a new way. And another uh, boost that we got for language study in the U.S. was in the year uh, 1958. In 1957, uh, Russia uh, launched a uh, satellite, the Sputnik, and this uh, set us for a spin, uh, no pun intended. And uh, so that's 1957, I think it's October, and uh, sometime in 1958 we passed the National Defense and Education Act. And this act proclaims that it is in the national interest to promote uh, math, science, and guess what? Foreign language. So suddenly, we had all this federal money being made available to the schools, and many of the schools are making it obligatory for kids to take Spanish, German, and French. Um, and that was just great. This is when I started my teaching career. We we're really in a roar, roll rather. Then came the revolution of the 1960s, and the kids had these sit-in demonstrations in front of the chancellor's offices, and they'd stamp their feet and say, I don't want math, no, 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 no foreign language, no. This seemed to be a worldwide <laughs> phenomenon, because in Paris, they were protesting the fact that uh, the Greek was obligatory. So the 60s were a re revolution source, and they did do irreparable damage to language programs, and we have not recovered from that. Now that said, look how fast that National Defense and Education Act was passed. In less than a year. That was in answer to an emergency of some kind of injustice. And how long has the DREAM Act been on the docket, if you will? Oh, ten, yeah, 10 years. It just stalled out. So uh, there's a lack of will there and we need to galvanize our uh, <coughs> politicians uh, to, to do something about this. Uh, then, uh, in the 60s, we do have a step in the right direction, sort of, 
and that was the Bilingual Education Act of 1968. But watch out because I said the word bilingual is not quite understood. Is it good news or is it bad news that a certain school district gets federal funding for bilingual education? Because uh, there's, uh, for bilingual education, there's two kinds. One is transition. This is where you have this group of kids that don't speak English fluently and what have you, and then we try to uh, put them in a holding tank and exterminate their Spanish and mainstream them into English only. That's transition model. And that's the one that that act mandates. Now the other model is maintenance. That's when you have something like Lindley, where you're trying to, uh, a, a, a truly bilingual school tries to nurture the English and the Spanish alongside each other. But under the original uh, uh, Bilingual Education Act, if you were caught doing maintenance, you ran the risk of losing your funding because that was not the intention of, of the law. And uh, the bilingualism or bilingual education can be a Trojan horse of sorts. Again in the 60s, down in, in Peru, there was a, a progressive uh, populist uh, government and they were starting programas bilingües. So they were going up into the Sierra to <coughs> programa bilingüe in la Sierra where two million people don't speak Spanish yet. And what was the purpose of this? to exterminate the Quechua language. That was really, the hidden agenda there was Programa de Castellanización. They were trying to Hispanify. Uh, and so, uh, watch out. So it's, uh, lots of times uh, certain terms can become a, a political football. You know, take conservation. Conservation, when it's talked about by uh, Chevron Oil Company, is different than conservation when it's spoken by the uh, Sierra Club. So, uh, on and on, and now we have the uh, English-only hysteria. Uh, my friends in Hawaii think that this is laughable. If you talk about English-only policy being discussed in Hawaii, which is the most multilingual state, they laugh. And uh, I say Hawaii is very multilingual, multicultural, and guess what? Hawaiians are very, very patriotic. They're very patriotic, but yet they understand uh, that uh, that something like English only doesn't have, uh, there's no room for it in uh, our century. And then we have the post 9-11 period. Uh, I suspect that 9-11 would not have occurred had we had a little more uh, linguistic and cultural smarts. That's my suspicion. Uh, about, I think it was in 2003, the Pentagon called the conference and it, it, the title was Language, a Call for Action, and I was privileged to be invited. This was a three-day conference held at the, at the University of Maryland. And um, so there I picked up a lot of uh, insights. Uh, that's the first time I heard the concept uh, uh, heritage speaker. And they, they pleaded with everybody at the conference to go back to their hometowns and see what they can do to, again, <coughs> galvanize a discussion of uh, making language policy uh, more rational. Uh, that's assuming there's a language policy to start with, which there isn't. So we need to uh, go about doing this. And uh, my message to the uh, school systems is to see what we can do to improve the articulation from kindergarten to 12th grade concerning language study because typically there's a hiatus uh, during the middle school period and we need to overcome that and uh, likewise once a person is out of, call, uh, out of high school or college uh, I would hope that uh, employers would uh, recognize and appreciate the linguistic skills that these uh, new employees have and I would hope that they would be remunerated accordingly. <coughs> that said, I thank you very much for your patience and uh, hearing this ex-academic vent <laughs> 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 out his frustrations on me. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you, Ms. Bill. Yeah, only Bill can do that kind of thing. <laughs> Terrific for us. Uh, then is your chance now. Forget that role as as.
camera person and assume your role as it says here. You're going to be the commentator for the forum. That's your role. That's what it says. <laughs> Uh, as a segue to what Bill just said and what really everyone just said, uh, my role really is to give a reaction. I'd rather make a commentary and appreciate some reaction back. And the whole history that you went over, Bill, fits right into this. Each of you indirectly or directly mentioned equal opportunities for all, for education for you, and many opportunities. And thank you for pointing out the program that you pointed out and so on. We all need to know about this. So I'd like to roll the clock ahead because 100 years ago that wasn't the case. When I went to college, that wasn't the case. But it is today. And I have evidence of this. And let me tell you right now, it's really astounding to see the evidence of this. Uh, in the last week, we have had two stories, and I'm giving them both equal time. New Sentinel and Journal Gazette both. Uh, one about the four Northside High School graduates. We're talking valedictorian, salutatory. We're talking top four. And then Fort Wayne Community Schools, Top 50, five per high school from each of the each of the community schools in Fort Wayne, and I counted them up. Forty percent are either minority or international. Praise God, that's wonderful. Isn't that something? <laughs> I, 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 I'm back, I'm back in our site because of Chancellor Wartell, and we're so privileged to have you here, Chancellor. Uh, this is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. North, well, to it compared to 100 years ago, yes, but today it's, it's possible for anybody, for any youth, for anyone, regardless of age. Valedictorian from Northside High School has received the Chancellor Scholarship to IPFW and is going to be a doctor. Twelve years ago, she did not speak English. I'm talking about bilingualism. Came here through Thailand to here as a, as a refugee for political freedom. Same thing with another person in the top four there. The two of them didn't even speak English. So you talk about learning, learning English as a second language and then going to the top of your class and now going on to college for equal opportunity for all compared to when I was in school and 100 years ago, that wasn't the case. I think it's great today that our youth today have such opportunity to do this. But it's up to the family, as everyone said, it's up to each person to decide. But I'd like a reaction to that in terms of how far we have come. We have a long ways to go. But I'll tell you what, when I looked at this, and here they are, and we're talking 40% of Fort Wayne, Indiana. I thought it was Chicago. I thought I was reading the Chicago <laughs> Tribune. No, really. This is a melting pot cultural diversity thing happening today in real life. Most all have scholarships. And several are going to IPFW and other community colleges and Ivy Tech and all over the place. Isn't that some? I mean, in other words, it's a success story. And I'm done, Max. I just wanted to make a comment rather than ask questions. <laughs> okay. Ben, Ben, you have your reaction. Good job, Ben. So, uh, we, we had four presenters and Dan making a comment uh, with the purpose of just getting information, their angle of things, and now any question that the public might have, that you might have, we will entertain and, and, and the panelists are free to select which one they would respond. So anyone with a question, please, this is the moment. Great, Ralph, go ahead. Uh, and question for uh, the 21st scholar. Uh, Martin. I, I wrote down my notes here as part of the, the 21st century scholarship program, a pledge of citizenship. I imagine that, that that's directed at those uh, students who may not currently be citizens. Well, no, good citizenship. Good citizenship, meaning okay. Okay. Yeah, citizenship. Good citizenship. Okay. Yeah. Not U.S. citizens. No, 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 no. No breaking the law. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. I actually have two questions. Um, one of that is in part of my uh, honesty, or I don't know how to say it. Um, my question is how an undocumented student can approach a college when they don't come with funds to continue with their education? I mean, I'm talking about uh, kids that uh, they, they have a pretty good uh, GPA. I, think, um, I met the guy that he had a 3.8 GPA. And he can't 
continue with his uh, education, right? Because he doesn't he doesn't have papers, and obviously he doesn't have money to to continue the education. I think it was like eight thousand dollars per semester. How can they approach and be help this type of kiddos? Bill, would you like to take that? I think uh, we need to revisit some of our policies. Okay. Uh, universities are known to actively recruit international students. They love to have students from this continent, that continent, and uh, somebody is subsidizing those students. And I say, why can't these uh, achievers who have grown up in the United States but don't have the proper documentation, why can't they be subsidized likewise in some way, starting with something like the DREAM Act where they're allowed to, to go to school paying uh, in-state tuition, let alone being allowed to apply because some schools are still stuck on the uh, El Numerito. Yeah, you have to have a numerito unless you're an unperson if you don't have a numerito. A numerito is the uh, social security number. And so some universities do not require this. And uh, I was looking at some letters of application the other day and I noticed that uh, at least uh, IU Bloomington issues a student number to the student that, that's to be used for the rest of the four years as opposed to assuming the social security number. Which, by the way, was never intended to be a national ID card. My old social security card says not for identification purposes. Right. So that is a uh, prostitution of the original intent, where you're having to show that uh, even to order an ice cream cone at McDonald's. For nothing. Uh, si. Si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, I know there's people here that might want to. Aunque sea en español, en español, por favor háganlo, ¿ok? Acerca de sus hijos es bien importante. It's very important. It's about the education for for your kids, ¿ok? And for you, the person that can answer your question better is Diana Jackson. And uh, she can help. If you know a student that has a 3.8 GPA, wants to go to college, uh, Diana, do you want to say something? Diana from Ivy Tech. Uh, my name is Diana Jackson. I'm with Ivy Tech. I'm, uh, I'm one of the uh, best jobs there because I have the fortunate to work with the international students um, and students who are also undocumented um, at Ivy Tech. Um, until July of 2011, after the bill, the 1402 bill, was enacted um, in the state of uh, Indiana, Ivy Tech um, had to change their policies as it relates to undocumented students. We in the past, were, we were able um, to give our students scholarships and we awarded many, many students scholarships out of with the outreach um, scholarship that comes out of my office. Um, and we were able to award many, many students. But however, um, the new bill supersedes Ivy Tech's policies and as a state institution, we are obligated then to honor what the state uh, requests. Um, I will say this, for international students that do come in and they find sponsors to come in and then they are able to pay their tuition. And so uh, many people know here today that I have reached out to the Hispanic community and, um, and I really strongly believe that it is a community issue that if we can get private uh, funders then to sponsor many of these students that deserve to go to college and want to go to college, that um, we can um, assist them. Um, Ivy Tech does not turn anyone away. Everyone is welcome, regardless of your status. The only thing is that they do have to pay the out-of-state uh, tuition costs. I will say that uh, we are still the least expensive school, so if they do decide to go to college, they can still come to Ivy Tech for about uh, under $6,000 for the academic year uh, as an undocumented student, and we do welcome everyone. So that's what I needed to say. And I personally do help students try to find scholarships and other funding as well. So um, if you have questions about that, just feel free to get my card. I'll have it for you, and uh, we can talk some more. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so
Permítanme repetir en español lo que Fernando dijo en inglés. Si alguien tiene una pregunta en español, no hay problema, la hacen y aquí hay como 100 traductores e intérpretes que nos, nos encargamos de interpretarlo. Así que si alguien tiene una pregunta en español, go ahead. Uh, any other question? Yes, go ahead. Come in, go ahead. somebody to go and I wonder if that will be some way that we can uh, get it cheaper or something. I I don't know. I, it's, it's, I'm just beginning with this foundation and I hope, uh, I mean, I have no idea. And that's my question. I'm not, I'm not sure what the question is, <laughs> but, but when, you, when you speak about the cost of education, One of the problems that we have, and Ivy Tech has as state institutions, is we're bound by state law to charge a certain tuition. Out-of-state students, in-state students, those are the only tuitions we can charge. Private institutions are able to work with you more closely because no one regulates them in the same way. Um, so if, if, it's not, if it's not a matter of money, You have a lot of money in your foundation, you can simply pay for the students to go. But, but working with private universities, St. Francis, Indiana Tech, um, Huntington, uh, you name it, uh, they're able to discount their tuitions in ways that can really help um, uh, needy students. Oh, it's not good. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want to say that uh, I can't stress enough. 
of the importance of, as you said, family support and family influence on education. Um, last year, I was taking classes as a returning adult. My daughter was enrolled at IPFW. My son and his girlfriend were taking classes at Ivy Tech. So we're all studying all the time, taking tests. And one day, my three-year-old grandson says, Grandma, I need to study. And I said, well, we can go on pbskids.org. And he says, no, I need real studies. And he pointed to my son's Rosetta Stone program. So he started studying Japanese and actually was learning it. So I, and we never told him, this is something that you have to do, that this is model behavior in our home on a regular basis. So I can't stress enough how much we as adults influence children growing up. Terrific. I believe, uh, Fernando, that we have space, uh, time, excuse me, for maybe one more question or two? Yeah, we have, as long as everybody's comfortable, we, I got plenty of time myself, and this is very important for me, and for them, and for yes. the kids, so we got, unless, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Allison. Uh, Thank I'm, you. Thank you for doing that. My name is, my name is Alicia. Uh, I'm from Fort Wayne, born and raised here. I'm a proud uh, employer of IPFW. I feel I'm an ambassador uh, of the university out in my community, out among my people. Um, I'm first of 14 children in my family to go to college. And I think uh, a lot of thanks and praise goes to what was known back then as the Benito Mata Center under John Rivera. Yeah, John's um, here! say that it's be I think that our community really needs to get that organization going once again because it was because of that particular center that my parents number one had a relationship with and trusted that organization they were the ones that opened the doors to many possibilities um, it wasn't a dream act for me it was a dream come true for me all my younger siblings in my family have all gone to college and gotten a college education. And that is alluded to my parents. I believe I have a moral obligation to help my people out. Because I know I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. I have a bachelor's degree. I also have a master's degree in education. And I went through IU school, Bloomington, through the groups program, just like Upward Bound. And it's really important that our community has a place that they can go to where they know that their mission is to help that family, help the entire familia at home. And I think it's important that we as a community gather around and do what we can to bring our center back up and going once again and let bygones be bygones, let leave the politics checked at the door because it's so important that we as a community start cultivating the lives of our younger children because it is a center like the United Hispanic Americans that understands that you can't just send a student to college without, especially for young Latinas. If it wouldn't have been for John telling my mom and dad, it's okay for her to go to college. It's okay, she doesn't need to stay home and be ten foot, uh, barefoot and ten feet behind a man with 20 kids. You know, that, that was okay for, it, for that cycle to be broken. And I'm really proud of the fact because now my children, it's not where you're going to college, it's, I mean, it's not if you're going to college, it's where you're going to college. And I think we as Latinos in this community really need to stand firm with the fact that our kids are our greatest asset. They are our greatest asset, and we need to start utilizing them to the best of our ability. Thank you. Thank you. I keep saying another comment. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to make one comment. Uh, in defense of the undocumented students, uh, these undocumented students are de facto residents of the state. Their parents are de facto residents of this state. The parents are de jure taxpayers. Mm -hmm. They are taxpayers. A lot of them are 
property owners. They have jobs, and sometimes uh, a, uh, an, a non-valid uh, social security number is used, and these people pay a FICA tax, social security tax is deducted from their, pay their payroll, and because of the mismatch between the numerito and the real person, they may never see that money. No, so, they, they may not, they will never. Yeah. So they're, they're, these people are not freeloaders. So it is a legal fiction that, that they're so-called illegals. And uh, something needs to be done. Uh, and I hope that we can put a bug in the ear of our uh, legislators. And I hope that uh, some aggressive prosecutor out there will one day invoke the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty. And perhaps the treaty might obligate the states to bend on this uh, tuition nonsense. I just want to make a comment about an observation. Uh, I, I do a lot of work with businesses. And um, after World War II, uh, Onassis purchased a lot of ships because they were for a dime for a ship because nobody wanted them. <coughs> but he had the vision to see that because of the war, uh, merchandise was flowing back and forth across the oceans. Since that time, now we have the internet, we have eBay, we have Amazon.com, we have commerce on a global market now. And to that end, I think bilingual people are going to be instrumental in accessing and taking advantage of that opportunity. So the fact that these youngsters speak two languages, that is great for them. Not only Spanish, I hope they speak Japanese. Japanese are the first ones who started doing this on a global, on a global market. They had the vision to see that happen. Um, so, in terms of the Treaty of Guadalupe, I hope it comes to pass. I think, I believe in the freedom of speech in the United States, and I don't think the Constitution says it has to be in English. So, I'm against English as a, an official language, I think we should be able to speak whatever we want. And that uh, if you want to get ahead in this, this country, however, I do believe that English and education is the equalizer. That will provide that opportunity. That was the ob observation I had. Terrific. Um, I just have one more comment. One of us. Gracias for winning. Thank you so much for, for coming. Uh, their education is so important. And I want to share something with you. Francisco, can you come over here? Francisco? And there's so many kids out there that we can be helping, okay? Francisco is my little brother and his big brother, okay? And there's oh. like over 400 kids waiting. <laughs> if Francisco will go to college, I don't know if he's at your value. Uh, I always tell him he's going to be the mayor, but Mr. Peterson, <laughs> whatever he wants to be, right? Uh, Francisco will go to college, he's my hermanito, he's my, and his big brother, right? And there's, if I'm not mistaken, how many hundreds of kids like Francisco waiting to be? We have around 600 on the list. And the waiting list. And we have children waiting to be on the list. Uh, I Francisco, San Francisquitas too, so there's <laughs> girls and there's boys too, so we can choose, okay? Francisco is now able to come over to our house, spend a couple of hours. I was his lunch buddy for two years, and now he's officially uh, his big brother. He's part of the family, right, Hill? Uh, and uh, he will go to college with that. There's so much out there that we can be doing, and uh, it's possible. Everything is possible. And again, education starts. Uh, not at the dinner table like we talked about last week with Chancellor Michael Wartell, but at the womb. ¿Verdad? Dice que la educación empieza en la panza. And I'm sorry, en la barriga. Dice, no. En la panza. En la panza. En la panza. En la panza. Okay. And it's true. Uh, because my wife will read to our kids while they were still in the womb. It's very, very true. Sarah, which is your daughter-in-law. Did the same for your grandkids. Uh, so education is key. Education is, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's 
the key to prosperity for everything. It's the equalizer, I would say. Educación es el equalizador, ¿verdad? Yeah. Eh, para que nos vean todos iguales, donde quiera que usted vaya, wherever we go, si tenemos educación, if we have education, nos van a respetar. ¿Verdad? Una vez más, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all of you. Ustedes son los que hicieron este evento. Thank you to Chancellor Michael Wartell. Uh, he has left, él ha hecho mucho por la educación aquí en Fort Wayne. Él fue el canciller desde 1994 uh, y se va a jubilar pronto en 2012. Pero IPFW, sin a huge growth, and not just IPFW, I seen because of IPFW growing competition. Ivy Tech is right behind us. <laughs> <laughs> Ivy Tech is right behind us. St. Francis College, right? All of them. There's more education. There we are, my friend. I'm curious as to what the participation of the Spice in the 21st Scholar Program. Our participation or the, the enrollment? Enrollment uh, and completion. Enrollment, the enrollment in, in, at our particular site, uh, Northeast North Region, is very low. Okay. It's very low. It, it, it should be doing a lot better. But what can we do to help you? You could work with the first class. Is the materials in Spanish? No, we uh, the state the state did that for two years, and they found out that what we utilize. What we, yeah, what wasn't being utilized. So the states they stopped putting the information in Spanish, but. It's just venues like this, getting the word out, making sure parents know and understand about the program, you know, and, and, and when we go into the schools to, to present to the kids, you know, that, that they are getting the information home to, 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 to the parents. But, uh, you know, like I said, it's a big responsibility when you're talking about you're, you're, you're presenting to seventh and eighth graders for them to get the right information home. So it starts with- something that we as a community can do. Yeah, you know, there's programs out there, but the problem is that the uh, cases are the spine community that's not aware of. So, you know, you say it's a low participation, but I think there's something that can be done. Um, yeah, I mean, if I, I, yes, I know there's something that, that, that can definitely be, be done, but I got, it, it has to, the information has to get to the ears of the parents. And it has to be in Spanish. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing. Well, that's possible. It has to be what we, as a community, as a community, to get this word out regarding your program. You see, with me, you know, I mean, we, um, um, we work through, we work a lot through schools. We, we, we try to get to, you know, venues uh, uh, like this so we can talk about the program. But uh, it is. You know, I, to, to put my finger on just any one thing, I can't really tell you that. I just know that our knowing the information, uh, knowing that the program's out there, knowing that they have a website that they can go to, that they can find out any more information that they did, because now the enrollment process is going to be online. So having all that information and get putting it out to the community and to the families, let them know that too. You know, and, and then just uh, the, the, the conversations, starting the conversations a lot earlier about students wanting to go to college because this is a program you have to start, you have to sign up in the seventh or eighth grade. You know, not waiting to, because we do get that a lot. We get families that call us up in the ninth, their kids in the ninth, tenth grade, hey, I heard about the program, I want to get my students involved in. Well, it's too late then. You know, it has to be seventh and eighth grade that they enroll in the program. So it's, it's a lot to be conducted, that can be done, but to pinpoint just one thing, I just like that. Just, I can't say it enough, getting the word out, you know, getting the word out as much as you possibly can. But may I comment yep. on this? The, the, one of the problems is the 21st century scholars program is really changing in this state, and they're reorganizing it entirely. I think one of the more practical answers to the, the kind of thing you're suggesting is for folks in organizations like this to talk with these people, figure out, figure out events that you can get to the parents, and, and whether, the, whether the, uh, the application forms are in Spanish or not, I mean, the state's not going to support that anymore, obviously.
obviously. Uh, whether they're in Spanish or not, if we can convince the parents that it's important, uh, then we can have people there that can help them fill out the forms. And the other, the other issue there is that it's a several year commitment, and that's always a problem for people. It's not, and it's not just the Hispanic community, it's the African American community, it, it's the white community. It, Everybody has a problem with a long-term commitment from seventh, sixth, and seventh, and eighth grade through high school, uh, and and the program hasn't. I don't think the program's worked as well as it could. Have. No, I know. I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Right. Uh, you we can help you. Well, yeah. Yeah. Information. Uh, one of the things that veterans are uninformed about is one that Latinos often serve in the military, and we've been in a big battle since 1991. I believe. And we are getting a lot of people coming back with Purple Hearts and service-connected disabilities. What I'm talking about is a thing called the remission of fees benefit for those type of people. That is the remission of fees. It, you can go right over it and not understand it. Even though you understand the words, you may not understand the benefit. The benefit is that children of veterans who have a service-connected disability or the Purple Heart may attend a state university free of charge. Free of charge. So we have a lot of a lot of Latinos that that have, that have served and they come back home with a purple heart, their kids automatically can go to college for nothing. And if we can get that it's not that information particularly, but both Ivy Tech and IPFW have full-time counselors for veterans. I, I understand and, that. What I'm talking about is the veteran we need doesn't get know, the folks it's to uninformed, it. and the exactly. parent is uninformed. Exactly. But you kids, when you go back to school and you have a, a, a friend whose father or mother was a veteran and was wounded or something, tell them about what I just said. Great. Uh, remember that uh, we invited these experts, these analysts, and they might have maybe five minutes to talk to you individually if you need, but uh, I believe that to be faithful to the time that we told you to be here and to them, uh, uh, what I would like to do is to thank Peter, Mike, Martin, Bill, and Fernando. And Excuse me for using those. Uh, and then, for this wonderful conversation that they uh, generated, and to thank you for coming here and for being interested in the topic of educating our children and realizing the dream of a college education. So, thank you so much.